Um, before I start talking what I was actually going to talk about, um, there's quite a lot of the stuff this morning fit, fits into some of the things that I was going to look at. What I'm actually going to be talking about is really a sort of case study where we were forced to, put, to uh, push the boundaries. But there's some of the things I jotted down which I think are key to all, all the things. So I think it was, I don't know who said it, like, um, do the self-set rules work for us um, and should, should the rules be broken? Well, the case I'm, um, first of all, I think the rules generally work for us, but they certainly need to be improved. I'll go back to your point about the code of conduct. There's all sorts of things that do need um, uh, modernising, should we say. And the example I'm going to use, we both broke the rules and also strangely kept to them at the same time. We uh, broke the rules in the sense we didn't really think about the rules whilst we were doing the work because we didn't have any choice. But on reflection, we probably actually didn't break the rules. Then the other one is comes back to your, your thing that you, you and I have spoken about many times, Rob, which is failure. This project, or this element of this project, was on the point of failure all the way through, and it's only through a lot of hard work from an awful lot of people that it wasn't a complete and utter disaster for everybody concerned. Um, but because of the threat of failure, it's actually what forced us to, well, we had to innovate simply because of the conditions. And then evaluation, if we're going back to failure, for what I'm going to show you, evaluation completely and totally failed from start to finish. In this particular, we, this site has been evaluated, or is being evaluated. This field was evaluated. There was an excavation in the, in, in the, in the field, but this feature was impossible to find. You could not have found it, even if you'd done a 100% evaluation, and it was an excavation, really. So just bear those in mind. And the other thing, somebody mentioned something about the comment about harm. Now, this has got nothing to do with what I'm going to talk, but I'm glad, I think it was you, you raised the comment harm. As and when the MPPF is changed, I would really like to get that word harm out, not out entirely, but harm is an exceptionally negative word that especially when you're dealing with harm that is less than substantial and especially low range less than substantial harm, often you're not even talking about harm, you're talking about change, but that's a sort of an aside point that just your, your talk made me think of. So anyway, on to what I'm supposed to be talking about. Sherford Newtown, uh, it's just outside of Plymouth, uh, it's about four or five miles on the outside, as it says here, five and a half thousand dwellings. Um, it's already under construction. Phase one, which is this area over here, is, is built and there's a community of about 2,000 people living in it. There's a school and all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's a major source of employment. It's also doing uh, innovative training for construction um, stuff as well. Um, our three clients uh, like to think this is an exemplar in terms of construction. I wasn't involved at the beginning. Um, I was brought in about three, four years ago um, when some of the works have already been done. There was no evaluation pre being granted consent, of which I can't tell you why, because I wasn't involved, apart from there was, I assume, a lot, a lot of politics to make sure that this, was, this scheme was delivered. So a little bit of a background. This was done before I joined. As you can see, an exceptionally extensive geophysical survey. This is the interpretive plot done by the now departed Alistair Bartlett. Um, as you can see, there's like all the red is archaeology, well, definite archaeology, should I say, and we've got large patches where there appears to be, inverted commas, nothing. Um, there's been... This is where we're sort of at at the moment. This was where we were at about a year and a half ago. All the dark blue is uh, mitigation works that have been done by Wessex Archaeology prior to my involvement. The light blue was what was being worked on at the time this was written, which is now about two years ago. And all the orange is where we're going to do more evaluation. The pink is where myself and Steve Reid, who's the county uh, planning archaeologist we were dealing with, decided we want to go straight to excavation with no evaluation at all because the geophysics was so clear. To give you context, we have some fantastic prehistoric archaeology. Wessex did a great job. Lots of public outreach. Um, if you go on their website uh, and search Sherford, there's, some, there's, there's a great website for all the work that they did. There was a lot of public involvement. Um, and we expected this kind of thing to carry on. Um, we currently have AC Archaeology working with us on site, um, who are doing lots of evaluation, lots of excavations as, as we move forward. But I'm not really talking about normal archaeology. 
Um, about June time last year, I got a phone call from site, from the project manager, from the development project manager, saying, Rob, we've uh, been digging quite a big hole and uh, we found a bone. Can you have a look at it? I'm not sure what it is. And he didn't seem that bothered. And to be frankly honest, I didn't really think about it much at the time. They sent me this photograph, which looks like what it is. It's a, it's a bone in a bag. I thought it was probably a cow because it's about the right size. Finding a cow bone in a hole in, in, in countryside isn't exactly unusual. And I took it seriously, but not really that seriously, I'll be honest with you all. Um, fortunately for us, AC Archaeology have two qualified and experienced cave archaeologists, which was uh, you know, a real boon for us. So when, when I, I got AC to go and pick the bone up, uh, and uh, their, their faunal people looked at it, and about two weeks later they came back saying, this is actually uh, an auric bone. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty intriguing. So I went back to the client saying, you know, we've got something pretty unusual here. And when you say a big hole, what, what are you talking about? It turns out it was that. <laughs> um, that is, that's 10 metres from there to there. Um, what had happened was... The, the area's been, the ground's being reduced for a road and the infrastructure for the houses. And so they had to cut down into the limestone. At the surface, this feature here, that's the top of the cave, that was solid rock, apart from a small bit. And as they were digging down, part of the, part of the roof collapsed and they were left with a hole, which of course they had to go down because there's a road, so it's a soft spot. So the geoengineers started digging down. At this point, I had no idea any of this was being done because it was just an engineering thing. Nobody had thought there could be archaeology down there. It didn't even occur to anybody. And then you see this little thing in here. That is a fissure cave of which, when the geoengineers went down, um, there was bones just falling out down this scree down here, teeth. Then when they went exploring, we got a wolf skull. Um, the guy on the right, um, you can see there's a big bone down on the bottom there. And then at the bottom here, we have a fractured mammoth tusk in situ. Uh, this is 10 metres underground and going back about 20 metres under the ground as well. So it's not just at the bottom of this hole, it's actually inside there. So at this point, we kind of thought, I'll be honest, yeah, shit, we've got a serious problem here. <laughs> Because it was in, just in, in the middle of construction, the, con the construction zone is completely around here, and you'll see some photographs that the, the, the foundations for the houses that were going to be there was already in. And had they built the houses, the front doors would have been there. <laughs> so, you know, we were faced with a problem, how do we deal with something? And I'll be frankly honest, I've never done cave archaeology before, and initially I was a little bit baffled about what the hell to do. Uh, AC Archaeology uh, and I got one of their teams to go down into, into the cave. Uh, we're very lucky that uh, one of the guys is a very experienced caver and also a cave archaeology specialist. Uh, I never thought in my career I'd ever need somebody like that. Um, but you can see the scale of this thing. This is Steve Reed standing here, for those of you who may know him. So you can see the scale. These are the foundations of the houses, literally on the, t on the surface. And here's a whole load of us standing there looking down the hole thinking, what the hell do we do with all this? Um, so it presented all sorts of challenges. We had nationally, borderline, possibly internationally important remains. Certainly if we'd got human activity, it would definitely be internationally important. Major construction problem uh, delays, major sales, because this, this is not just at the beginning. This already in parts of this site already had houses be going up and being sold. Um, the five houses that are above the cave are all affordable units, um, obviously, uh, which we've had to lose. Obviously, massive health and safety challenges, to say the least. Um, to sheer practicality of how do we deal with something underground, literally underground, rather than just in a deep hole we've come across, which I'll come back onto, insurance prob um, problems, uh, adverse publicity, or the risk of adverse publicity, and very real commercial sensitivities by the client, worried about the implications of what bloody great big holes next to houses means in terms of sales, which is a very legitimate concern they had. So we had to keep this quiet 
from the outside world for months and months on end. Um, the, key to, the key to all this, I won't bother reading it all out, is, first of all, it was partnership between all of us, between myself, Steve Reid, uh, for the County Council, Sylvia Warman, who's the uh, South West uh, HE um, Science Advisor. We, with input from Historic England, had to get an expert team together, which isn't an, a normal field work team. We had three professors of a quaternary science, um, which I've never had to deal with before. It's very fascinating in itself, and I can see I've spelt Winchester wrong as well, so apologies. <laughs> um, experienced cave archaeologists, and also non-cave archaeologists at AC. Um, but also, there's all the other stuff. I mean, you saw the size of that hole. So we had, to we had the engineers, we had obviously the health and safety people, vertical access specialist, cave rescue teams, paramedics, um, plus also there's the construction going on all around us with huge, you know, 50, 60 tonne moxie dumpers driving past, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, and then, of course, the client. You know, this is a dis total disaster for the client. Finding archaeology during construction, unexpected that is, is always a disaster. But this had, of course, extra, extra problems. Um, cost, the whole thing has probably cost at least three quarters of a million pounds if you take the cost of the archaeology and the delays, possibly a million. The archaeology alone, by the time you finish, is probably 150 grand. Um, but the key was to, whilst trying to keep everything quiet, was with get this team together, get a sensible sampling programme, because we couldn't be down there forever, because to be down there to do a complete 100% excavation of these deposits would have meant we'd have to put serious engineering down into the hole, which would have cost a fortune in itself, I and mean, we could be digging down there for years, um, especially as this, according to our, to our academics, is a once-in-a-lifetime, that's more than once-in-a-lifetime, this is probably the most important um, Pleistocene discovery is, since the Victorian era, according to our experts, that's not me saying it, because normally they've been found during um, Victorian engineering and um, quarrying works. So this has been totally untouched for 30, 60,000 years. Um, so we had to get this team together, work out what we do, how do we do this in as short a time as possible, because the client obviously has to keep on building. But also, how do we do it safely? You know, what are we trying to achieve here? Are we trying to full-scale full excavation, or is this sampling and trying to preserve in situ in the future? Um, and then insurance. Um, we ran into major insurance problems because AC archaeology is only insured to dig down to three metres, not 10 metres, <laughs> and then 20 metres out underground. And we had two months of delay whilst trying to work out which of the organisations we were working with and for would take the responsibility of the principal contractor. The ground workers wouldn't take that responsibility. One of our clients worried about revealing their insurance details to others. Uh, and in the end, Taylor Wimpy stood in as the principal contractor. But that put two months delay, at which time I had lots of people shouting at me, saying, what the bloody hell's going on? Can't we just get this thing sorted? Why can't you just get AC to add an extra premium onto their insurances? In which case, we're actually dealing with Aviva and all these companies who just seem saying, no, until we get all this stuff, nobody's doing anything. So, fortunately, uh, one of our board is a solicitor. So we, we, had, we had one of our board members advising on insurance back to, to like, to Taylor Wimpy and Vistry and so on. So we're very lucky to have a lawyer on our, on our books. Um, this is the sort of thing we were dealing with. Um, we have uh, woolly rhino, woolly rhinoceros, um, hyena, uh, horse. We had a full wolf skeleton um, and various other creatures. They'd, they'd, they probably died somewhere on the surface and got washed in 30 to 60,000 years ago. There's probably a small hole in the surface. Uh, the wolf probably went in alive because it was the only full skeleton. Probably went in trying to find some food because he'd smell some, uh, some dead creatures down there and never managed to get out again. Um, so we had a team of these, team of four down there for six weeks. Uh, I don't know how they did it, I couldn't do it. I never actually went into the cave once because our insurance forbid me to go into it anyway. Um, 
But whilst we were doing this work, I've never had to deal with a, a, a change.org petition against something that I'm doing. <laughs> we had got to the end of the works. Myself, Steve and Sylvia had had a meeting with everybody on site on the Wednesday that we'd signed everything off. We had a huge sigh of relief that we'd been able to get this done and delivered sort of on time. Uh, I won't say to budget because there was no set budget. It really is spend as much money as you need to spend. And then this, uh, this petition came out, which has now has only got 8,000 signatures, but it went from about two to about seven and a half in about two days. Uh, on the Friday evening, I got a phone call from Steve saying, Historic England suddenly said, we can't do anything more at the moment. I think they got a bit spooked by the potential bad, but, uh, poor publicity we might all get, and I don't mean that as criticism at all, but my Friday evening went from having a glass of wine to celebrate we'd finish it, to fin that we'd finished it to a whole series of phone calls with the client, um, trying to work out how the hell we deal with this bad publicity, potentially bad, pu pu blah, blah, bad publicity. Um, but we were able to turn that round, thankfully. And we got a hell of a lot of publicity. Some of you may have had the misfortune of seeing me on the TV and the news quite a lot back in February. And we even had Russell Brand talking about it at one point. He was about to do a show in Plymouth. Um, and we actually got a lot of good, um, good PR in the end. But what did we do with all this thing? Well, we, we can't keep the cave open. It's impossible. It's too dangerous. Many people who were objecting imagined, I think they imagined like a, a cliff with a nice cave going into it rather than a huge gash in the ground. So we've had to lose these five units, which unfortunately they're all affordable units. Yes, they can be squeezed in elsewhere, but they're already committed to a, to a housing association. So there's a lot of negotiations to do with contracts of, of the houses themselves. Um, the whole has to be, de it's been designed to be backfilled so we keep this is all preserved, so it's not full, full of concrete and so forth. Uh, I won't bore you with the details. Um, but we've got to the point that everybody is very happy that we've, A, done a very detailed, sampled investigation of these amazing remains, whilst also preserving them in situ. In reality, that means they'll never be seen ever again, because there's going to be a few hundred tonnes of rock in that, in that hole there, so nobody's ever been able to go in again. But all the experts, all of our academics are, are happy that we've got as much data as we can get usefully without, if we could stay longer, but it would cost more and more and more, and the returns would be much and much less. And in the end, we're going to have a little pocket park. As you can see, these are some ideas, not, not my work. These are the, the landscape uh, architects, which is going to be mammoth and ice-aged themed. I don't know what they'll do, but I quite like this one because you can have... Uh, a uh, sort of sculpture of mammoths coming up out of the ground, which I think is quite neat. Um, but when I suggested this as a talk to Bob, he said, well, can you talk about standards and guidance? You know, did they apply? And yes, of course they applied, because they apply on everything that we do. We're an RO, I'm a, member of, I'm a full member of CIFA, so of course they apply. I've got to think with them. But I can honestly say, until you ask me that question, Rob, I don't think anybody in the team had even thought about the standards and guidance. Uh, the, the academics we're using aren't members of CIFA. They're probably not even aware of the standards and guidance. But I think in reflection, I think we did actually follow, follow it, but not because, of, not because of the standards and guidance. We were forced into decision making on the hoof with an awful lot of big teams involved. The stakes very, very high. But it was this, this paragraph in particular, I think, poses for me the biggest problems. I don't have a problem with the principle, but we had to keep this thing quiet. You know, we couldn't let the public and the rest of the world know until we'd basically sorted it and agreed everything with everybody and got the preservation in situ in place. We had hoped to actually fill the hole in first as well, because the last thing we wanted is some, some members of the public traipsing across the construction site trying to get in this hole, and then they join the wolf of never getting back out again. So for me, we had to break that rule, absolutely, um, because, essentially because of the next thing, the, the, the health and safety. So, on reflection, when I went back looking at the standards and guidance, yeah, they worked well, but I think that was simply because we just did what was right, rather than actually getting too tied up in, in the words. But it has made me reflect, there's quite a lot of the standards and guidance, is, is, reflects a world, I think you said this morning, 
Peter, of this, uh, the Code of Conduct back in the 80s. Well, the standard guidance is a bit more modern now, but it still is actually reflecting a world that I think has changed, nothing to do with the whole that we had. But, but anyway, so anyway, that's as far as I want to go. But the last thing, this was the team who was underground for six weeks. I wouldn't wanted to do it. The, the girl on the, the woman, sorry, on the right, she'd only qualified about a year before. How she's going to uh, top that in her career, I really don't know. <laughs> She volunteered to go. She happened to be the smallest person that AC Archaeology employs, but she, did, she volunteered to me because she wanted to, rather than she was the smallest. And then on the right-hand side, bizarrely, Plymouth Museum, if you're ever in the area, please go. The, their museum, the box, is, is absolutely brilliant. And they have a gallery called the Mammoth Gallery, which has a full-size mammoth, Willie Mammoth, in it, which the coat is made by the same people who made the um, outfit for Chewbacca, apparently. <laughs> um, and the good thing about all this, in terms of going back to public outreach, rather than all the publicity we already had, is Fiona, who's the uh, curator of archaeology at Plymouth, has already got in her mind where the local real mammoth stuff is going to go, because we've actually accidentally found something they didn't even know they had in their own area. So I spent a whole day being interviewed by the various newspapers and um, TV crews in there, and... Um, yeah, the locals love this thing anyway, but now we've got this story to go with. The amount of excitement, and people came to the museum the day that we were doing the filming, because it was the day after we'd done the press release, apparently the footfall through the museum was 500% more <laughs> than, than since before COVID came along. So uh, it was, on one level, a total disaster. It's cost the client a fortune, massive delays, huge amounts of stress, but through lateral thinking, we've actually been able to deliver what I think is a, you know, an absolutely top-notch piece of work and a top sort of archaeology. You know, this time last year, I had no idea about Pleistocene archaeology at all. So anyway, thank you very much.